people are always nagging about saving money every day. But I guess we have no choice but to cooperate. In an empty house, Catherine sneaked inside. She moved a chair to the utility room, turned off the main power switch near the ceiling, and laughed with delight. We gotta save on electricity, right? Nonchalantly returning the chair to its spot, she locked the door using her spare key and left. She probably couldn't have imagined what would unfold next. Who would have thought her actions would lead to such chaos? Before marrying me, Bob lived with his dad and mom. His mom adored Bob and treated me, his wife, very coldly. The saving grace was that Bob always listened to my side of the story. But this seemed to irritate his mom, leading her to pull such stunts. Yet, she probably never imagined it could be life-threatening. After this, I began re-evaluating my relationship with her. My name's Jessica, 30, working in a corporate setting. Bob and I, along with our second grader son, Michael, live in a condo near our in-laws. Bob and I work at the same company. While Bob is in sales, I work in the administrative department. Even though we're in different departments, we understand each other's jobs. After getting married, we both continued working and share responsibilities at home, whether it's housework or raising our child, Michael. Bob's parents are still alive and live a 15-minute walk from our apartment. When we first got married, there was talk of us moving in with them. However, my mother-in-law was firmly against it. So, we decided to rent an apartment close to their home. My father-in-law was a workaholic in his younger days. But after Michael was born and he retired, he started visiting us more often, playing with Michael and keeping him company. He's a kind man. However, it seems I haven't built a good relationship with my mother-in-law. She seems overly attached to Bob, perhaps out of frustration with her workaholic husband. When Bob and I first got married, she would often find faults with me. But after Michael was born, her attention seemed to be divided between Bob and Michael. But her strict attitude towards me hasn't changed. If I were a stay-at-home mom, I might have had to face her more often, and that could have been stressful. Fortunately, since I work, I get to vent out my frustrations about her with my colleagues. I've been working at this company for 10 years now. Currently, I'm the head of the administrative department, mentoring newcomers and handling important tasks assigned by my superiors. Work is an essential part of my life. Maybe being a career woman bothers my stay-at-home mother-in-law. She spent her entire married life as a homemaker, raising Bob and managing the household chores all by herself. Her relationship with her dominant husband wasn't the best. While I work hard outside the home, with Bob's help, we split household and childcare duties. Seeing this, my mother-in-law might be both envious and irritated. I do empathize with her to some extent. However, if she continues to hold on to those feelings, our relationship will only deteriorate. I've tried to bridge the gap numerous times, but she remains stubborn and distant. Thankfully, she's a loving grandma to Michael, which has always been a relief to me. I hoped that with time, our relationship would heal. But as the days go by, I find myself gradually giving up on that notion. Initially, my mother-in-law was against living with us. However, after Michael's birth, the desire to see her grandchild brought her and my father-in-law to our place quite frequently. Previously, since both Bob and I were working, the house was empty during the day, so utility costs weren't a concern. Michael, being in the first grade, used to attend after-school programs and would return home after 5 p.m. But once he moved to the second grade and stopped attending, he started coming back home around 3 p.m. Spending more time at home, playing games and watching TV, I noticed our electricity bills creeping up. The major spike in our bills is due to my father-in-law's concern for Michael. He didn't like the idea of a young child having house keys and staying alone till the parents return. So, he suggested that he'd meet Michael when he returns from school and stay with him. Given the safety concerns nowadays, we appreciated his offer and handed him a spare key. The two of them started coming over in the mornings, turning on the air conditioning and waiting for Michael, causing our bills to surge significantly. While I'm grateful to my father-in-law for looking after Michael, I felt that them coming over just in the evenings when he returns from school would have been sufficient. My mother-in-law once remarked, staying here saves us some money on our electricity, which honestly irked me more. While I didn't want to be overly frugal, 
especially considering the need for cooling or heating, I was bothered by the waste. She would often leave lights on in rooms she wasn't using or leave the TV on even when she wasn't watching. I told her, please turn off the lights when you're not using a room. Her retort was, why are you being so stingy when you both work? I've tried talking to her about this multiple times but always faced complaints. Even though Bob and I both work, we want to save for Michael's education, potential caregiving costs in the future, and our own retirement. Money never seems enough for all these needs. Bob tried to subtly address the wastefulness with his mother, but she believed she was doing no wrong and felt unjustly blamed by me. One day, both Bob and I had to work overtime, which meant we'd be returning home later than usual. I usually shop for dinner on my way back from work and cook for the five of us, including my in-laws. Considering we'd be eating late and also worrying about Michael, I informed my father-in-law, I'll be getting back a bit late today, but I'll prepare dinner once I'm home. Could you please wait a little longer? Knowing him to be content with just some beer and snacks, I suggested he could munch on the pickles or some leftovers from the fridge, to which he agreed. After finishing work and shopping, I hurried home only to be greeted by a delivery guy at the door. Wondering what was going on, the delivery person informed me that my mother-in-law had ordered sushi for five and instructed him to collect the payment from me when I returned. To my surprise, it wasn't from a budget sushi place, but a premium sushi restaurant. I was taken aback. I paid the delivery person and rushed inside to confront my mother-in-law. You could have left something prepared if you knew you'd be late, she retorted. I've been so busy lately, I didn't have the time. And ordering such expensive food without telling me is a problem. I whispered, trying to avoid involving Bob and Michael. But she raised her voice. Tim. Listen to this. Jessica here told us to wait hungry till she gets back. Even Michael was hungry, right? Holding on to Michael, she sought his agreement, mom's being mean, isn't she? Feeling sorry, my father-in-law, Tim, took out his wallet to reimburse me, but I hurriedly declined, I can't accept this. I merely wanted to convey my concerns about unnecessary expenses, but she just wouldn't understand my feelings. A few weeks later, on a particularly hot day, both Bob and I had to take day trips to different locations for work. My workaholic father-in-law has always been supportive of my job, so he assured us, I'll take care of Michael. Just focus on your work. Michael was thrilled about spending time with his grandpa, and we could concentrate on our tasks without any worries. In the evening, as I boarded the train to return home, I decided to check my phone. And noticed over 20 missed calls. The first 10 were from Michael. We had given Michael a cell phone since the first grade, just in case we weren't home due to work. I had an important meeting and had my phone on silent, which is why I didn't notice the calls. My heart raced with anxiety. I tried calling Michael, but it went straight to voicemail. Seeing missed calls from Bob too, I tried reaching him. But to no avail. With a heavy heart, I waited, and as I stepped onto the train platform, Bob called. I'm at the general hospital. Dad suddenly collapsed, and they rushed him in an ambulance. What happened? Bob, who had finished his business trip earlier, seemed to have learned from Michael's call that Tim had been rushed to the hospital. Up until now, Tim had been perfectly healthy and leading an active life. I was deeply concerned, wondering what could have happened so suddenly. Bob said, according to Michael, after having some beer and raw fish, Tim started having stomach pains, vomited, and then collapsed. Raw fish? The raw fish brought to mind the fresh one I had left in the refrigerator along with some beer as a thank you to Tim for looking after Michael today. But that raw fish was freshly bought this morning. It shouldn't have been something that would upset anyone's stomach. For now, I headed straight to the hospital. At the hospital, I found Bob, a visibly shaken Jessica, and Michael looking pale. How's Tim doing? It seems like food poisoning. Probably from the raw fish, Bob responded. But that raw fish was fresh, I had just bought it. Well, according to Michael, Dad did mention that the raw fish tasted a bit off. When I asked Michael about it, even though he's young, he vividly described the situation. When I got home from school, Grandpa was watching TV and eating raw fish with his beer. And? 
He said the beer was warm and there was something weird about the taste of the raw fish. Shortly after, he started complaining about stomach pain and threw up. Remembering that moment seemed to scare Michael and he clung to me. I hugged him tight and stroked his hair. Trying to comfort him. He soon smiled, which was a relief. However, thinking back to Michael's story, something struck me as odd. The comment about the warm beer and the odd-tasting raw fish. It didn't make sense that items stored in the refrigerator since morning would be warm. Wondering if there might have been a power outage, I checked the local utilities website but found no relevant information. Michael also mentioned that the AC was on when he got home, so the house was cool. While Bob, Michael, and I were discussing, I noticed Jessica murmuring something while looking distraught on a hospital corridor sofa. Catherine, are you okay? You look pale. Oh, shut up. This is all your fault. She shouted at me. What are you talking about? What did I do? You shouldn't have bought that raw fish in the first place. But it was a token of appreciation for Tim, and I bought it fresh from a reputable store. But just because it's fresh doesn't mean. She stopped mid-sentence, looking as if she had just realized something and covered her mouth with her hands. Mom, what did you mean just now? The hospital corridor was quiet as visiting hours were over, and everyone present heard Jessica's voice. Bob confronted her, what's going on? I didn't do anything wrong. Catherine exclaimed. What are you talking about? Explain yourself. Bob, usually calm and gentle, was glaring at Catherine with an evident expression of anger. Swallowing nervously, Catherine stepped back from Bob's intense gaze, and turning to me, she shouted, It's all because of you, always harping on about saving and being frugal. What does my mentioning savings have to do with what's happening now? Confused, I responded slowly, trying to understand. Overhearing us, Michael suddenly chimed in. You know, the iced tea wasn't cold either. The iced tea? You mean the one kept in the fridge? Yeah. I drank some when I got home from school. But it wasn't as cold as usual. Though it seemed impossible, a thought crossed my mind. Recalling Catherine's earlier remarks about savings and what Michael just shared, I cautiously asked Catherine. You didn't, by any chance, turn off the main breaker, did you? Seeing Catherine's face turn pale and her mouth agape. Both Bob and I felt our suspicions were confirmed. Actually, we had installed baby monitors in the house, initially for Michael when he was a baby. Knowing he'd be home alone, we had set up a few more that day. The baby monitor had accidentally captured the scene where my mother-in-law Catherine had turned off the circuit breaker. I played back the video on my cell phone to show her. In the video, Catherine enters from the front door, and with no one else in the house, she carries a chair to the laundry room, turns off the main power switch near the ceiling, and laughs gleefully. Gotta save on electricity, right? Then, with an innocent expression, Catherine returns the chair, uses the spare key she had to lock the front door, and leaves the house. I showed the video to Bob and Catherine. Mom, did you really turn off our breaker? We have this as evidence, you can't deny it. I thought you said you weren't gonna be home all day, so I did it as a favor to save electricity. Come on! You know that turning off the breaker can spoil everything in the fridge, right? And Michael was coming home too. I wanted to teach y'all a lesson. You keep nagging about saving money. Even though both of you are working and earning well, you keep penny-pinching. Even after all this, Catherine continued to blame me. Both Bob and I were so dumbfounded that we couldn't even speak. Anyway, I had gone shopping to prepare something special for Tim and Michael. But then I got a call from the hospital saying Tim had been taken there. I was shocked. At the hospital, the doctor suspected food poisoning based on the symptoms. When Catherine learned that Tim had eaten raw fish, she realized that turning off the breaker had caused it, and she seemed genuinely scared. Why on earth did you prepare raw fish of all things? I never imagined you'd turn off the breaker, Catherine. It's all your fault, Jessica. I did nothing wrong. As Catherine was raising her voice in the corridor, the treatment room door opened, and the doctor and nurse came out. After receiving a stern warning to keep quiet, we were told that Tim had regained consciousness and that we could enter the room. 
Bob and Michael went into the room, and I forcibly took Catherine, who was still standing in the corridor, inside. Lying on the bed in the treatment room, Tim, still pale, looked at us. When Michael spoke to him, he showed a faint smile and said, I'm okay. Bob looked relieved and gazed down at Tim. I'm so sorry, Tim. It was the raw fish I prepared that made you sick. When I said that, Tim just shook his head. Turning to Catherine, who was sitting next to me, he said coldly. I heard everything. What did you do? What if it had been Michael who ate it? I didn't know you had prepared raw fish for Tim in the fridge. It's not about who it was for. Someone could have been in grave danger. This time, it was just an old man like me getting a stomachache, but you put someone's life at risk. Jessica is not to blame. You should apologize to her. Although his voice was weak, Tim's stern words made Catherine tremble with fear. Perhaps she remembered how strict Tim used to be in the past, she looked genuinely terrified. Catherine, who had been reprimanded by Tim and was trembling, never apologized to me. Both Tim and Bob seemed to be fed up with her. Concerned about Tim's health, I tried to calm the situation. Fortunately, Tim received treatment in time and the doctor informed us that there was no serious threat to his life after a few days of hospital care. Both Bob and I were relieved. The real hero in this situation was Michael. According to Bob, when Tim felt ill, Michael had called 911, answering all the questions the paramedics asked diligently. Though he was in a daze, Tim had witnessed everything and shared the story with Bob. I had always thought of Michael as a young kid, but I was amazed and proud of how much he had grown. After staying in the hospital for about 10 days, Tim was discharged when he could eat normal food again. One day, Tim called Bob and me to come over to their place while Michael was at school. I know I've caused a lot of worry this time. We're just glad you're okay now. It's really good to see you back in good health, Tim. Both Bob and I were relieved to see Tim looking well, but our attention then turned to Catherine, who was sitting next to him, looking downcast. I called you both here today because I have something to tell you. We leaned in to listen to what Tim had to say. Catherine, don't you have something to say? I did nothing wrong. Still on about that? Fine, I've had enough. I want a divorce. What? Not just Catherine, but both Bob and I were shocked by Tim's sudden declaration of divorce. Dad, what's gotten into you? Talking about divorce out of the blue? Well, it's not just about what happened this time. I've been thinking about how we've treated Jessica over the years. Maybe it's my fault for being so focused on my work and neglecting our family, maybe that's what turned Catherine into this. Tim said, apologizing with a remorseful look. Tim, I can't forgive what Catherine did. The thought of Michael possibly experiencing the same thing as you did scares me. I'm sorry. But I thought Catherine deserved a chance to apologize. That's why I called you two here. But she shows no remorse. As Tim glanced at Catherine, she glared back at me defiantly. Why should I apologize when I did nothing wrong? And what's with you, Tim? Always trying to look good in front of your daughter-in-law. Mom. Enough already. I can't forgive what you've done either. Bob. Are you planning to abandon me too? Perhaps not expecting such harsh words from her beloved son, Catherine looked shocked and clung to Bob. If you can't apologize to Jessica, I'll never forgive you, Mom. What? You've brainwashed my Bob. He used to be so kind and would never say such cold things. It's all because he married you. In her hysteria, Catherine tried to confront me, but Bob effortlessly pushed her away, causing her to fall to the floor. Clearly shocked by Bob's reaction, Catherine sat dazed. In the end, Catherine continued to blame me until the very last, grudgingly agreeing to Tim's suggestion of divorce. She later moved out and lived alone in a small apartment, scraping by on her pension. In exchange for not seeking alimony, Tim made her promise never to see Bob or Michael again. While Catherine was reluctant about not seeing her grandson and son, Bob's own reluctance made her acceptance inevitable. Evidently, living solely on her pension proved tough, and she had to take up a part-time job. Tim once told us he saw her being scolded by someone much younger than her, 
which was a humbling sight given she'd never worked before. I hoped that, working on her own, Catherine might come to understand how working mothers like me feel. Meanwhile, Bob and I continued to work hard as always. Michael matured a lot through the whole ordeal. He started to insist he could stay home alone, and occasionally, by the time I returned, he'd have dinner ready, which was a pleasant surprise. It's bittersweet seeing your child grow up faster than you'd imagined. Tim started living a relaxed life on his own, occasionally visiting our apartment. With Michael growing independent, Tim began enjoying his hobbies like golf and attending board game clubs, truly living life to the fullest. While we've had our challenges, we hope to live happily as a family from here on out.